morning, turn with me to Joshua chapter number 10. Joshua chapter number 10. In the beginning of Joshua chapter number 9, we see that there's an alliance formed against the chosen of Israel. And it was an alliance made up of six of the cities that the Israelites were supposed to conquer. And uh, if you read Joshua chapter number 9, you'll see that the Gibeonites decided that they weren't going to join that league. Instead, they would trick the chosen of Israel into believing that they were from a far country. And uh, they made a treaty with the Israelites that uh, pretty much said that they, the, the Israelites did not destroy the Gibeonites. And what the, the result of that was they did, in fact, get that nice treaty. And uh, they tricked the Israelites into it. And while they tricked the Israelites, the Israelites, a lot of the people wanted to kill the Gibeonites. But the, the priest and Joshua said, no, we can't because we vowed a vow. They were tricked into a vow. But the, because they had vowed that vow, they weren't going to be able to destroy the Gibeonites. And so what happened to the Gibeonites, they became bondsmen. And they did the woodwork and they drew water for Israel and for the house of the Lord, the, the temple, the altar of the Lord. The league or the treaty the Israelites made with Gibeon said that they would let them live. So Israel would have to protect them from the enemies as well, right? If Israel had made this pact or this league with the Gibeonites, it meant that Israel was going to protect them from the enemies of the land as well. And so uh, there was another alliance formed that we'll see in Joshua chapter number 10 of five cities. And these five cities... Uh, heard about the treaty that the Gibeonites had made with the Israelites, and they decided that they were going to go try to destroy the Gibeonites. And they were scared because of the greatness of the city of Gibeon. This morning we're going to look at the fear of the enemy, the faith of Joshua, and the intervention of God in the situation. And the chapter ends with the destruction of the rest of the southern cities of Canaan. We will see God's will will be accomplished His way every time, no matter the opposition that we face or the circumstances we find ourselves in. Let's read verses 1 through 27 of uh, Joshua 10. Now it came to pass when Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, had heard how Joshua had taken Ai and had utterly destroyed it as he had done to Jericho and her king, so he had done to Ai and her king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them. That they feared greatly because Gibeon was a great city as one of the royal cities and because it was greater than Ai and all the men thereof were mighty. Wherefore Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, sent unto Hohum, king of Hebron, and Pyram, king of Jarmuth, and uh, unto Japhia, king of Lachish, and unto Deber, king of Eglon, saying, Come up unto me, and help me that we may smite Gibeon, for it hath made peace with Joshua and, the children, and with the children of Israel. Therefore the king, the five kings of the Amorites, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, the king of Eglon, gathered themselves together and went up. They and all their hosts had encamped before Gibeon, and they war against it. And the men of Gibeon sent unto Joshua uh, to the camp, to Gilgal, saying, Slack not thy hand, for thy servants come up to us quickly, and save us, and help us, for all the king of the Amorites that dwell in the mountains are gathered together against us. So Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear them not, for I have delivered them into thine hand. There shall not a man of them stand before thee. Joshua therefore came unto them suddenly and went up from Gilgal all night. And the Lord discomfited, uh, discomfited them before Israel and slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon and, ch and chased them along the way that goeth up to Beth Horon and smote them to Azekah and unto Makeda. And it came to pass as they fled from Israel and were in the going to Beth Horon that the Lord cast down great stones from heaven upon them unto Azekah, and they died. They were more which died with hailstones than they whom the children of Israel slew with the sword. 
Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when, jo when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said in the sight of the Lord, Son, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Agilon. And the sun stood still, and the moon stayed until the people had avenged themselves upon their enemies. It's not, is not this written in the book of Jashur? So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven, and has, uh, hasted not to go down about a whole day. And there was no day like that before it or after it that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of a man. For the Lord fought for Israel. And Joshua turned in all Israel with him unto the camp to Gilgal. But the, these five kings fled and uh, hid themselves in a cave at Machedah. And it was told Joshua, saying, The five kings were found hid in a cave at Machedah. And Joshua said, Roll great stones upon the mouth of the cave and set men by it for to keep them. And Stay ye not, but pursue after your enemies, and smite the hindmost of them. Suffer them not to enter into their cities, for the Lord your God hath delivered them into your hands. And it came to pass, when Joshua and the children of Israel had made an end of slaying them, which with a, great, uh, with a very great slaughter, till they were consumed, that the rest which remained of them entered into fenced cities. And all the people returned the camp to Joshua at Machedah in peace. None moved his tongue against any of the children of Israel. Then said Joshua, Open the mouth of the cave, and bring out those five kings unto me out of the cave. And they did so, and brought forth those five kings unto him out of the cave, the king of Jerusalem, the king of Hebron, the king of Jarmuth, the king of Lachish, and the king of Eglon. And it came to pass, when they brought out those kings unto Joshua, that Joshua called for all the men of Israel, and said unto the captains of the men of war, which went with him, Come near, put your feet upon the neck of these kings. And they came near, and put their feet upon the necks of them. And Joshua said unto them, Fear not, nor be dismayed, be strong and of your courage, for thus shall the Lord do to all your enemies against whom ye fight. And afterward Joshua smote them, and slew them, and hanged them on five trees, and that uh, they were hanging upon the tree, until the evening, and it came to pass at the time of the going down of the sun, that Joshua commanded, and they took them down off the trees and cast them into the cave wherein they had been hid, and laid great stones in the cave's mouth, which remain until this very day. Heavenly Father, God, we're thankful this morning for your word. God, thank you for the rain that you bless us with. God, be with the message this morning. God, hide me behind the cross. God, help me to only say the words that you would have me to say. God, if there's one here that doesn't know you, God, I pray that today would be the day of salvation for them. God, be with the message. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The first thing we see as we enter into Joshua chapter number 10 is that there was a fear in the enemy of Israel. Wasn't there? There was some fear. And I, I don't know about you guys, but if I heard about uh, Joshua leading these people into Jericho, their mighty city, right? It was the fortress city. It was the city uh, that all of their mighty men and all of... It, it was a city of great war. It was, it was one of the great cities in all of Canaan. If I had heard that Joshua and the children of Israel marched around it for seven days and, and then uh, the city came tumbling down, I think that I would be a little scared. And then they went on to Ai. And what did they do in Ai? They, did, they, they didn't do the exact same thing, but they went and destroyed everything. They utterly destroyed everything except for what God told them they could take. And so uh, the, the people were scared. The, the enemies were scared. It all starts when Adonizedek, the king of Jerusalem, heard about the battle of Ai. And how it was utterly destroyed by Israel. He had also heard about Jericho and the destruction that was there as both these cities were utterly destroyed. And then, if that wasn't enough, then they heard about the city of Gibeon. Who had made a, 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 a treaty with Israel and they were afraid because of their size and strength of Gibeon. And so they were scared because if these guys were part of Israel, now Israel was even bigger. So what we're going to do is we're going to form an alliance and we're going to try to take them down. We see the reason for their fear. Now we see the result of their fear. Adonai Zedek, the king of Jerusalem, sent for help from some of the cities in South Canaan. So he sent to Hoham, king of Hebron, and Pyram, king of Jarmuth, and Japhiah, king of Lachish, and Deber. King of Eglon. So he sends these guys a request. He says, hey, why don't you come up here and help us? And he, he says, come up unto me and help me that we may smite Gibeon. 
If we look at those cities in order, starting north to south, it was Jerusalem, Jarmuth, Hebron, Lachish, and Eglon. And so they had sent to all of these cities, and there's a few cities that they didn't send anybody to, right? And so I'm sure that he sent them to the cities that he thought had the best chance of beating the Israelites. Why were they? Why did they want to smite Gibeon? What was what was the point of it? It's all because Gibeon had made peace with the Israelites, and they were afraid of what the Israelites could do with Gibeon on their side. Their plan: they gathered themselves and all their hosts together and went up to Gibeon. So they, they not only gathered the five kings, but they went and got their best men of war, the men of valor, uh, their best fighters, their best soldiers, and they went and then camped. They surrounded. The plan, they surrounded Gibeon, right? And so they were going to go in and destroy it. They made war against it. Isn't it amazing what fear can do to us? Isn't it amazing? How many of you have ever been so scared that you did something dumb? I have. I've done lots of dumb stuff in my life. It, it caused Adam and Eve to hide in the garden, right? When they sinned against God, what did they do? They said, uh, when God asked them why they were hiding from him. He said, we were, we were scared because we're naked, right? That, they, that was the first form of fear in all of the Bible. So why does fear make us do dumb stuff? Because we, we are not living a life of faith. Uh, it caused Abraham to lie about Sarah being his sister instead of his wife. Why? Because he was scared that he was going to die. When, when, the, when the, the Pharaoh asked him, hey, why didn't you just tell me this was your wife? You could have been on your way. He said, well, I was scared you were going to kill me. Fear caused Abraham to do that. It caused the Israelites to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Why? Because they kept choosing fear over faith. And here it caused an alliance to be formed against Israel. They could have had a, a, an alliance of five cities. They could have had an alliance of 15, 20, 30. How many ever cities they could find. But if God was fighting for Israel, no amount of enemies that came together could overcome them. Can I tell you this morning? That if God is fighting for you in your life, no amount of enemies can destroy you. Isn't that good news? Uh, we fight the enemy every single day, but when we have God on our side, the enemy cannot destroy us. Let me look at the faith of Joshua. Joshua had a lot of faith here in this chapter. I, when we get to it a little bit later, but think about what Joshua asked God to do. Joshua asked God to have the sun stand still. And the moon to stand still and not to move until the battle was over. I don't know about you guys, but I've never had that much faith. I've never once asked God to hold the sun still or hold the moon still. But Joshua had enough faith to do that. Hudson Taylor said this, Christ liveth in me, and how great the difference. Instead of bondage, I have liberty. Instead of failures, quiet victories live within me. Instead of fear and weakness, a restful sense of sufficiency in Christ. What was the difference between the faith of Joshua and the fear of the, the alliance formed? God. God was the difference. We can put our faith in anything we want, can't we? We can. We, we put our faith in a chair when we sit down. We, we put our faith in, in, in the ground that's going to hold us up as we walk. We put our faith in our car that is going to go out and when we go outside after church this morning it's going to start, right? We put our faith in a lot of things, but the most important thing we can put our faith in is Jesus Christ. Everything else will fail us, but God cannot fail us. We see that Gibeon becomes under attack. And what does Gibeon do? Gibeon sends some men to Israel for help. Gibeon reminds them of their treaty. He says, hey, Joshua, remember, I know we kind of tricked you into this whole treaty thing, but you remember the treaty we made a few weeks ago? Yeah, hey, we're going to need some, some help. And so they said, they said this, slack not their hand. And that means don't abandon us. Don't forget about us. Hey, we made this treaty. Come on, come, on, come help us. And uh, he asked them to come up and save them because they were on... They were under attack from the five kings of these cities and all of their men of valor. And what does Joshua do? Joshua comes up and helps. He brings uh, all the people of war and the mighty men of valor with them to Gibeon and to fight with them against the enemy. I'm thankful for what the Lord tells them next, aren't you? Look what the Lord tells them. In verse number 8, it says, And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear them not. 
Why? For I have delivered them into thine hand. There shall not a man of them stand before thee. So the Lord tells Joshua, don't fear them. And he goes on to tell them why they don't need to fear. He says, uh, fear them not because I have delivered them into your hand. There's a difference between us doing something in our own strength and us doing something in God's strength. The difference is that God delivers those things into our hands. God delivered the enemies into the hand of the Israelites. And the, the Bible goes on to say that not a man of them will stand before thee. There is going to be no person left behind of those places. Joshua goes up into the battle and the Lord destroys the enemy. When the Bible says discomfited, it means to smote or to strike. And so the Lord uh, struck them before Israel and slew them with a great slaughter at Gibeon and chased them along the way that goeth up to Beth Horon and smote them to Azekah and unto Mekedah. And so they were, they were in a valley uh, right outside of where the battle was and, and, and they, they chased them down into this valley. Joshua goes up to battle and just, the Lord destroys them. He slew them with a great slaughter and then he ran them down into that valley. The next thing is pretty cool, isn't it? God sends a hailstorm. People who, people who say the Bible is boring have obviously never read it. Think about this. It, 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 it would have been cool just if you know, Joshua would have destroyed the enemy, right? If, you know, he just goes in and destroys them. Uh, but God sent a hailstorm to destroy the enemy. It says that the hailstorm killed more people than the sword. Isn't that amazing? That God, God is in control of everything. We know that, right? God is in control of everything. God created everything in six literal days. And because He creates it, He also controls it. Just as uh, Joshua, just as when Jonah was in the boat and there was a great storm, just as when the, when the disciples were going across the Sea of Galilee and a great storm pops up and Jesus gets up out of the boat and says, Peace be still, and there's stillness, just as Jesus walked on the water. Think about all the, the mighty things that God has done through creation. This is just another proof that God created it all. God sends a great hailstorm. Uh, think about this. There was a hailstorm in Orient, Idaho, or Orient, Iowa, and it injured 47 people on August 1st, 1980. They said that the hail reached three inches in diameter. That's some pretty big hail. The storm caused the most injuries in the U.S. of all the hailstorms. That uh, so they rated these hailstorms by the amount of people that injured. This was one of the the, the worst hailstorms that had ever happened in the United States since it's been reported. Think about that. And, and God sent a hailstorm greater than that. There is nothing that God cannot do. It doesn't even compare to the amount of people that, that died as a result of the hailstorm that God sent to destroy the enemy. Look at Joshua's prayer. Joshua prayed that the, that the sun would stay still over Gibeon and that the moon would stay in the valley of Agilon. So really, he, he's praying that the, there would be enough daylight so that he could destroy the enemy. And the amazing thing is that God answered that prayer. Isn't that amazing? The God who creates it controls it, right? So uh, you say, Brother Cody, this is just a story. No, this happened. This is real life. The Bible says that there was not a day like this before it or a day like this after it. This is the only time that this has ever happened. It's because Joshua had enough faith to ask God to help him. And you say, Brother Cody, why does all this matter? Because the Bible says that the Lord was the one fighting the enemy. But when the Lord fights the enemy, there is no way that we lose. Amen? But when the Lord is fighting the enemy for us, we cannot lose. We will be undefeated. What an amazing God we serve. We think about all the things the Israelites saw as they're leaving Egypt. Well, first off, while they're in Egypt, they see those ten plagues as God is showing who He is. Right? And then as they leave Egypt, what happens next? They get to the Red Sea and they cross the Red Sea on dry land. The Bible says the water was congealed beside them. Think about that. And then if that wasn't good enough, you know, God's like, hey, I got something else for you. They cross the Jordan River and the Jordan River stand, stands up on a heap 25 miles upstream. 
Think about how good God is. And here we see that God caused the sun and the moon to stand still. The key verse in chapter number 10 is verse number 14. Look at verse number 14. The Bible says, And there was no day like that before or after that the Lord hearkened unto the voice of man. Why? For the Lord fought for Israel. Who's fighting your battles this morning? It's really easy to try to fight a battle by yourself, isn't it? I don't know about you guys, but I'm, I'm pretty independent. I, I don't like to have a lot of help. I don't like to ask for help. I, I, don't, I, I don't know why my dad's the same way. We're, we're not going to ask for help. We're independent people. And so we can try all we want to do what we think is right. Correct? We, we can try as hard as we want to fight a battle. We can try everything we want. We can be like the, the mariners as Jonah is, is in, the, in the boat as, they're, as he's about to get thrown into the well. We can try to throw all of our baggage over, right? We can say, oh, we don't need this anymore. We don't need this anymore. But guess what? If the Lord is not fighting the battle for us, we will lose. Think about the first time that the Israelites went to Ai. What happened? The Lord, they, they went from the presence of the Lord, and the Lord wasn't with them because they left him behind. And they left him behind, and so, and what happened in that first battle? They lost. They were, the 36 men lost their life. Why? Because they, they didn't go with God. And I'm thankful this morning that the Lord fought for Israel. Can I tell you this morning that the Lord will fight for you? But the difference is you have to let Him. He's not going to go where He's not wanted. So we have to let the Lord fight for us. Joshua had enough faith here to know that, uh, to know that even though they were outnumbered, they would never be outpowered because no matter what he would face, God would always be stronger than the enemy. No matter how uh, many enemies you face today, no matter what you're facing today, what you need to know is that God can overcome it all. You just have to let him. Let the Lord fight for you as he fought for the Israelites. And then we see that Joshua here returns to home base. He returns to Gilgal. And then we see that God intervened for the Israelites. God intervened. He, he caused the sun to stand still. He sent a hailstorm. God did all these miraculous things so that the Israelites could see who God is. Then we see that the five kings fled. The five kings made it out of the battle alive, didn't they? And they fled and they went and hid inside a cave. But there is no place that we run that God doesn't know where we're at. Isn't that right? I know I keep... Bring up Jonah. We've been going through the book of Jonah on Wednesday nights. But no matter where Jonah would have tried to run and hide, God would have found him. Amen? No matter where we try to run and hide, no matter how fast we think we can outrun God, we can never outrun God. We can never hide from God. God knows where we are all the time. Why? Because God is everywhere at one time. While the people are getting destroyed, the kings run off in fear and hide in a cave. And they, they hid in that cave of Mankado, which is between Agamon and Lachish, so right there in the middle of both those cities. Joshua finds out about this cave, and what does he do? He seals it with stones, and he puts some guards around it, and then he sends the rest of the guys, hey, we're going to go destroy the rest of these enemies really quick before the sun goes down. And so they went, and they destroyed them. The Bible says there was a great slaughter. They were taking no prisoners. They were leaving nothing behind. Why? Because what happens when they would take stuff and what happens when they would not destroy everything is that they would fall back into idolatry, right? They would fall back into idolatry and so that they were not allowed to take any prisoners. Remember, they could only take the things that God permitted them to take. They made their way back to Makedah where the kings were being held after this battle. They went in peace and no one said anything against Israel. Why? Because they had saw what just happened. No one was going to say anything. No one was going to talk any mess about Israel, were they? Because they had seen what God had done for them. When God fought for them, no one was safe. Joshua gets the kings out of the caves and he smote them and then he slew them and they hung them on a tree. And he, at night he took them down and put them back in that cave and sealed it. And the Bible says they're there unto this day. God was not going to allow people, the enemy, to try to overcome Israel. God will take care of His children, and there is no enemy that we face that God 
cannot defeat. No matter what you're facing this morning, God can defeat it. Then we see in verses 28 through 43, we're not going to read it all, but we see that there was the destruction of the rest of the southern cities. Not only did Joshua destroy Jerusalem, Hebron, Jarmuth, Lachish, and Eglon, but he also destroyed more cities in South Canaan. He, uh, in, look at verse number 40. The Bible says, So Joshua smote all the country of the hills, and of the south, and of the vale, and of the springs, and all their kings. He left none remaining, but utterly destroyed all that breathed as the Lord God of Israel commanded. So these cities were not just destroyed, were they? It wasn't just like they went in there and, and caused some caused uh, the, the city to just be a little bit destroyed. No, they were utterly destroyed. There was nothing left. Why? Because God commanded them to do it. This land that they were in belonged to them. God had given them the land as a possession, and they were going forward for the land. Look at verse number 41. And Joshua smote them from Kadesh Barnea, even unto Gaza, and all the country of Goshen, even unto Gibeon. And all these kings and their lands did Joshua take at one time, because why? The Lord God of Israel fought for, or the Lord God of Israel fought for Israel. Think about that. I know we've already said it once, but it's a good reminder. If the Bible says it twice in one chapter, I think we need to be reminded of it. The, let God fight your battles. Let Him fight your battles. He wants to. Aren't you thankful for someone who wants to fight the battles for you? Aren't you thankful for someone who, who wants to, to want your best interest? Someone who wants to, to show you that He is God and that He is God. Good. I'm thankful this morning that we do serve a good God. Now, He's not just a good God. No, He's a great God. But the God we serve is great, and He is greatly to be praised. While we might not be fighting Adonizedek, the king of Jerusalem, or Hohem, king of Hebron, or Pyram, king of Jarmuth, or Japhia, king of Lachish, or even Debir, uh, king of Eglon, we are fighting an enemy every day. Our enemy is strong, but our God is stronger. Like Joshua tells the people in verse 25, we have no reason to fear or to be dismayed. To be uh, Dismayed means to be caught in fear, like a, it's a, a stronghold of fear. But we have every reason to choose courage over fear because the Lord will destroy our enemies. Conclusion this morning, we have a choice to make, all of us. And that choice is whose side are you on? Right? And Joshua, in the, in the last part of Joshua, Joshua chapter number 24, it, it says, uh, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We have two choices. Right? We can serve God or we can serve the devil. That's the only two choices. No matter what anyone else tells you, you're, you're serving one of those two people. Whose side are you on? All of us are born enemies of God. All of us are born in enmity with God, right? We are an enemy of God. And the only way that you can change that is by believing in Jesus Christ, His death, His burial, and resurrection. So this morning, if you never trusted Christ as your Savior, today is the day. Today is the only day. You have no other day. Right now, and I don't want to scare you or anything. I don't want to scare you into salvation. But the moment that you leave this building, something could happen. Amen? So, uh, you, we don't know. The only moment we have to live in is this very moment. And so if you never trusted Christ your Savior today, is the day, or maybe you say, Brother Cody, I'm not letting the Lord fight my battles. Give your battles to the Lord. You, you say, Brother Cody, I'm stressed out all the time. Give your battle to the Lord. I'm stressed out about whatever. Give it to the Lord. The Lord will fight that battle for you. And the difference between the Lord fighting for us and us find it for us, is the Lord will never lose. Let's all stand. In 123, after we pray, Father, thank you for this day, God. Thank you for all the many blessings that you bestowed upon us, God. Thank you for the book of Joshua, and God, just uh, the lessons that we can learn from a book that it was thousands of years old, but God, your, your Bible is a timeless truth. 
God, it's the truth that we can get every single day. God, if there's one here this morning that doesn't know you as our Savior, God, I pray that today would be the day. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen.